Hi, I'm Paul Jay. Welcome to the analysis.news. Uh, in a few seconds, I'll be back with Adolf Reed to talk about his new article, The Entire United States is Now the Reichstag Building. And uh, please don't forget the donate button because we, we can't do this if you don't do that. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe. If you uh, most importantly, come to the website, get on our email list, and we'll be back in a few seconds. In a recent article titled, The Entire United States is Now the Rush Act Building, Adolf Reed writes, It's time to be blunt. The right-wing political alliance anchored by the Republican Party and Trumpism coheres around a single concrete objective, taking absolute power in the U.S. as soon and as definitively as possible. And they're more than ready, even seemingly want, to destroy the social fabric of the country to do so. They smell blood in the water. They have a strong majority on the Supreme Court and a majority in the federal judiciary. Overall, Republicans imagine that with the aid of the aggressive campaign of disenfranchisement they're pursuing in 43 states, they'll take control of one or both houses of Congress next year. Further down, Adolph writes, it is not far-fetched to worry that in 22 or 2024, could mark the end of proceduralist democracy to which we've been accustomed. He concludes with this, a crucial characteristic of the current situation is that the antagonism between the pragmatic and the visionary that liberals have often used as a cudgel against left aspirations and programs, the ubiquitous, quote, now is not the time, or quote, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, is passé the way forward both to avert the most dangerous possibilities and to begin working seriously to change the terms of political debate is to push for and propagate a public good framework for government. Now joining us is Adolf Reed. He's a professor emeritus of political science at the University of Pennsylvania. He's taught at Yale, Northwestern, and the New School for Social Research, and is considered by many to be a leading voice a progressive and socialist thought in the United States. Thanks for joining me, Adolf. Oh, hi, Paul. It's my pleasure, man. Always good to hang out. Thank you. Well, start start with the title. What 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 did you mean by this is a, a Reich? The, the whole country is a Reichstag moment. And also keep in mind that a lot of uh, our viewers are younger and may not know what you mean by a Reichstag moment. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I think it'd be good for them to find out. But but the. Uh, um, well, what I mean by that is, uh, you know, after um, the Nazis had, in effect, come you know come to power in Germany, um, there was a suspicious fire set in in the Reichstag building, which is the parliament, uh, and you know, which the Nazis used as an excuse um, you know, to clamp down, to impose uh, to you know, to impose martial law, uh, to crush the left and the trade unions, and and uh, and, and and really to enact the dictatorship. Uh, and um, and just after watching uh, you know, Trumpism, right, and the emergence of Trump, though, though, though I've said I said to somebody not that long ago, I think Trump, I, I think it's a mistake to center too much on on Trump himself. Trump is, I think, more like a cross between uh, you know, the Lonesome Roads character from the 1950s film, A Face in the Crowd, and maybe even Lee Harvey Oswald, right, because uh, he's the Front man who, who um, around whom these very dangerous uh, factions and the tendencies in the right that, that have been there for all of our lives, right, um, congeal, right. I mean, people, uh, you know, we should recall that early, um, you know, the more, you know, the less uh, whacked out uh, the Republican candidates in you know, 2016 tried to do everything they could to suppress him, but and then they figured out how to make it work for them. Right. Um, these these tendencies, which I discuss in, in the article, uh, have have been around since the 40s, at least. Right. Ultra uh, the ultra uh, the reactionary, like often the American equivalent of, uh, of uh, the Juncker class in Germany. Uh, and they've never been committed, but, you know, to popular democracy like of any sort. Uh, the, the happiest in the dictatorship, uh, which is, you know, by the way, a 
principal condition for re realization of the neoliberal understanding of a utopia anyway, right, is to get a democratic government. And, and, and Reagan, well, they, they congealed around Goldwater, right, and his candidacy for the presidency in the mid-60s. You know, mid Reagan came to power partly on the strength of, of that political base and helped to bring them in a little uh, closer to the mainstream from the fringes of American political life. Um, Bush br brought them in, in a little closer, and Trump has like, given vent to them. And, um, so, so it's not so much people, you know, um, um, extremists congealing around Trump you know, as it is uh, that what we're up against is, is in fact, um, um, a pretty well organized and, and more or less cleverly, if dangerously orchestrated, Right, a political movement, and it's an explicitly anti-democratic one, uh, and that's what we need need to face up to. And I think it's a lot. Uh, uh, I mean, if if as I've argued, like in that piece and elsewhere, uh, and I'm certainly not alone in making this argument either, that uh, you know, neoliberalism has come to a point where it's a, pretty much exhausted its capacity to deliver enough stuff to enough of the population. Uh, to sustain its uh, legitimacy as a democratic order, and I apologize for the functionalist summary, then there are only two ways forward. And it's like we're at a T intersection, right? You either go right to, to authoritarianism or left uh, you know, to something that approaches like a, a social democratic orientation to government. And, 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 uh, and uh, this was kind of the spirit of you know, one of the quotes that you read about how um, – how the liberal and uh, and the left agendas you know, at this moment converge not so much around you know, defending Bidenist half measures, but like understanding that if 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 we can't keep the Democrats in power in 2022, or for that matter 2024, but you know four comes after two. Last time I looked, uh, then we are seriously facing a danger of of. Uh, of an explicit or a de facto push. And as I said in an email to some friends a few days ago, and I'll shut up after this, that A, when you look around the world and, and see the emergence of authoritarian uh, capitalist regimes, Hungary, India, um, uh, um, I mean, Ukraine, right? Um, and, um, and Bolsonaro, like in Brazil, I would toss in Boris Johnson. Uh, you, know, you know, that kind of feeds the idea that neoliberalism is in trouble as, as a democratic order, uh, and, and especially if you include, you know, the rise of what are summarized as nationalist or even less appropriately uh, you know, right-wing populist movements and, and, and the tendencies around Europe and, and the rest of the world. And that shows that there's a problem or suggests strongly that there's, that there's a systemic problem here. And people like Adam Tooze and others write about it, but also, um, but like if we look at at, at at recent history and forms of, of U.S. intervention in places like Brazil, Bolivia, and Ecuador, uh, you know, the prospect of a of a de facto constitutional coup, right, where where the courts um, undermine what I mean, democratic institutions, and then look at the composition of the U.S. Supreme Court now. Um, it, it's well. My quip was that if, if, if a constitutional coup is good enough for the U.S. to deploy in uh, Latin America, well, it's good enough for, for for the ruling class to deploy here. Well, haven't they already deployed it uh, in Bush right. versus Gore? Uh, right. The, the Florida the Florida vote that essentially was a constitutional coup. Right. That's right. Yep. It certainly was. So so, so the framework has been um, established uh, at already. And, and, and as you point out in your article, uh, to a large extent legitimized by the, much of the leadership of the Democratic Party, by Gore not fighting Bush over what happened in Florida, you know, really out of class solidarity. I don't know what else you can explain it with. Well, well no, I think that's absolutely right. And by the way, I just noticed uh, in, in, in a New York Times article a couple of days ago that Schumer was largely uh, no responsible for, for encouraging Kirsten Sinema to run for the Senate because she was a conservative Democrat. So, 
Well, I mean, they would argue because that's the only kind of Democrat that could get elected. I don't know if that's true, but that's what they would argue. But I don't I don't think the I don't know if they expected her to be that conservative. Well, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, listen, listen, let's go back to your use of the Reichstag fire, uh, Mm -hmm. because you're not the only one that used that. Uh, The chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Uh, Millie, in the oh, yeah. lead up, in a lead up to the events of January six, uh, and right. I think, and I think there's been far too much focus on what happened on January six. The real issue is what happened before January six. No, absolutely. Which, yeah. which, which the Financial Times uh, called uh, on January fourth. They had an editorial saying a coup in progress, which right. not many people paid attention to at the time. Uh, but now we, assuming these quotes from Millie are correct, that are in Woodward's book and others, uh, that he said this is a Reichstag moment, and the uh, apparently the head of the uh, CIA said there's a right wing coup in progress. But I think that points to something very interesting, which is that there is a split in the ruling class at, at about uh, certainly about the idea of a Trumpian coup, and I, I certainly agree with you. I, I've been using the phrase uh, Trump is the buffoon tip of a fascist spear. There's a real right. serious fascist movement there. Right. No, that's right. But yep. maybe that's what Hitler was, too. Right. Well, 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 you may know that Hindenburg always uh, referred to him as a little Bavarian corporal. So and and von Poppen and all the rest of those guys that thought he was a buffoon. Right. <laughs> Until he wasn't. <laughs> well, say you know they, you know they, the Americans have been doing this abroad. You know they create people like uh, what was his name, Nor- Noriega in Panama. Right. You know they create these little monsters, and then they right. start to believe that they're they're you know chosen by God, and then they get out of their control. Now right. they created one inside the United States. Yeah, well, yeah, that's right, and uh, uh, and um, you know, chickens do have a tendency to come home to roost, right? And, and, and and I admit, I mean, that, that I can't help. Well, any, you know, person on the left who who's like lived through Vietnam and Chile, uh, and and on and on, uh, I think it would be tough, tough for anyone you know, with that experience not to have at least a moment of Schadenfreude about you know, um, what about what's going on here, here now, uh, because it is a matter of uh, you know what we've done elsewhere coming home to us. And the, even but with the Russian um, interference in the 2016 election, I mean, uh, what was kind of striking to me is the self-righteousness of, you know, with which the liberals complain about having the chickens come home to roost. Right? It's almost like, no, no, no. I mean, that's good enough for us to do to them, but, right? but, but uh, not to ourselves. But, you know, that's not a healthy emotion either, like especially when we know exactly what, what we're facing. Um, yeah, yeah. let me just say, I'm I still not in, entirely sure what the Russians actually did. We have to rely yeah. on American intelligence agencies for so yeah. much of that. And I don't I'm not my my instincts are certainly not to rely on those agencies. Uh, oh, but uh, no. but I but I just want to say again what I keep saying every time this topic comes up. Um, if if the Russians are accused are guilty of everything U.S. intelligence agencies accuse them of, and I'll say again, I I, I don't know whether they are or they're not. Um, I couldn't. It, it's so minor. Like if you're talking about the the Russians undermining American democracy, it doesn't come close to what the American oligarchy has done to undermine American democracy. And and, be, and, and as you point out in the article, so much of this Trumpian alliance, uh, the conditions, the soil for it was seeded by the corporate Democrats. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, and uh, yeah, I go so far as to say that um, that Obama was kind of the warm up act for Trump in pretty much the same way that Jimmy Carter was the warm up act for uh, Ronald Reagan. So I mean, here we are. And, and, and it's always the same, right? Like, so, uh, but yeah, in fact, I just saw like a Times article a couple of days ago on this about how uh, you know, Midwestern working class voters are the people who were most hurt by you know, Democrats' trade and you know, disinvestment policy. So um, what do you think is going to happen, right? I mean, and, and it doesn't have to take – and, and, and uh, uh, um, you know, uh, the, you know, the vicious um, you know, racist and sexist and you know, homophobic and 
xenophobic um, expression that, that the frustration has taken is, yeah, to some extent, it's it, it's organic, right? And, but, but it's organic partly because this has been a dominant trend in American political discourse, again, for for you know, for a half century. Right. But, and the Democrats haven't offered them anything, right? I mean, I go back to this point often, you know, all the time that um, – that, you know, Larry Sabato at the University of Virginia, who I think had, has the best uh, data on who, who voted how in 2016, uh, identified you know, between six and a half and nine million people who voted for Trump, who had previously voted for Bernie Sanders and Obama at, at least once. So that tells you that there's got to be something else going on there right, right, besides backward aggrieved white white men, right, uh, who, 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 who couldn't abide the idea of of a black person in the White House. Um, now, now there's some people on the left, uh, and the left is a pretty broad term, what's left, but they argue that that this sort of focusing on the fascist threat and Trump is exaggerating the danger of Trump and taking the heat off the corporate Democrats, and they they sort of see that there's not really that much difference between them uh, and, and if anything, they spend more time uh, savaging the corporate Dems than they do going after. And they can even see certain elements, whether it's Tucker Carlson or others, uh, as sort of allies in, in this fight. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mentioned this to somebody uh, you know, not that long ago that, um, that there was um, a sliver, right, a, a sliver it, you know, within a corner of the internet left, right? That for some time uh, was um, kind of in, enthusiastic about my arguments, which is what one reason I uh, paid attention to this, who at the same time uh, sort of took this, this line um, to an extent of arguing that the nationalist right and the authentic left or the post left, I think some of them are calling themselves now, are the natural allies, right, uh, against, uh, you know, the corporate Dems uh, and the liberals. Now, uh, I think that's, um, and, and I mean, some of these people even have referred to themselves unironically as Strasserites uh, in uh, honor of, of, of Gregor uh, I mean, Strasser, who was the, so the left wing of national socialism. And, and I said to somebody, so I guess they didn't watch that movie until the end, right, because it plays out in a way that's not too good for you know, for um, you know, our side of things, but but the people generally who take that that view, I, I think I'd have to say, yeah, if I think you need to get out more and 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 like get off the internet and pay attention to what's going on, what right, 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 politically, because in one state after another, where 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 the Republicans are in power. They've been moving systematically, right? You know, to disenfranchise voters on a mass scale, to to reject um, um, federal authority, you know, to punish municipalities that try to impose federal law, right? But um, when, uh, uh, I mean, over uh, you know, your state governments attempt right to to um, uh, um, to just to, to dismiss federal law, right? And, and they're doing this strategically, self-consciously. This is what the abortion, this is probably what the abortion cases are all about. Uh, and, 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 and the redistricting, right? I, I mean, so, 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 so in creating more and more of the Republican safe seats, right? Control of state, of, 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 of state legislatures. So, so, so for instance, um, in, in, in the Florida now, the clown who's governor there is is criminalizing um, at adherence to federal mask mandates, right? I mean, so, so, so there's something serious that's going on out there. Actually, there, and there's another piece which uh, just come to my attention recently. I mean, maybe other people have seen this, but apparently there is a constitutional argument that's being advanced with a great deal of seriousness that the final choice of the electoral college votes 
is up to and can be solely up to the state legislatures. Oh, yeah, in other words, but in other right. words, it doesn't matter what the popular vote is. If they have right. any excuse at all, like if it's a close election at all. And and apparently there's an argument that even the governor, because in some of these states you have a Democratic governor governor with a Republican controlled state assembly, that that they can even in spite the governor can't veto this, that the state assembly could actually just give the electoral votes to the Republican presidential candidate uh, and, and, reg and simply disregard the popular vote. Right. And Paul, I mean, you add all that up. And to me, but, but it just says that, that that other argument, right? Like the argument that, that the corporate dims are the main danger, uh, you know, are the main danger is fundamentally a dilettantish argument, right? Because like it doesn't take, take, take account well, it, or, 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 or like maybe it's more, but like, or, or, or it's more like a religious argument, right? That people are so accustomed to wanting to demonize the corporate Dems that like they become the devil, right? Right in this narrative, but but it but it just seems to me that it's very difficult to, or should be very difficult to hold on to that view if you watch what the Republicans are actually doing, you know, both at the you know, at the national level and and also at the state level, and and, and the way that they've been stoking. Um, anti-government sentiment through, through the um, um, through, uh, through through the course of the pandemic is telling in that regard too, right? Right. I mean, the idea that that my right, which I allocate to myself, which it seems to me to be such a Protestant what, what way of thinking about the world, but you know, my right, what, what, you know, which I allocate to my what, uh, sorry, which I allocate to myself to carry like an AR-15. Right uh, into a daycare center, uh, Trump's no pun intended um, concern with public safety, right? Or that my right, uh, you know, not to wear a mask or to get vaccinated, Trump's public health concerns. It's crazy, right? And it's something like a moral panic, right? But it's not really about. And the right again has been very clever um, in in uh, doing this. But when you start to peel away the nature of the objections, more more often than not, my sense is that it's not really about vaccine anyway, right? Uh, or mask mandates. It, it it's it's about discrediting government and, and demonizing government, right? Um, and I'm mean, even going back to the to to the to, to the stolen election narrative, right? Well but I think a deep structure, you know, to that argument is um, that no real American would, would have voted for Biden, and and only real real Americans should be permitted to vote. So the only way that Biden could have been elected it, it is by the contrivance of you know, of the Democrats to collude with people who are not re real Americans. And it doesn't matter whether you know they're illegal aliens or they're blacks or they're gays, or 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 or, or I mean they're liberals. It's sort of condensation symbol that, that can call up you know, any one of those, right, you know, at the proper moment, um, you know, to justify what, like, the argument that even though there's absolutely no empirical evidence of, of, of voter fraud, the very fact that all these people who shouldn't be permitted to vote, voted, is itself like an effect of an expression of fraud, right? And that there's a lot in common between this, the, the Trumpian base and and the Hitlerite base in the sense right. that, you know, the 1920s, as you know, in, in Germany was extremely, you know, what's the word, sexually permissive. The the culture and art uh, was uh, libertarian in the in, in in the in the sense of uh, that the Nazis could declare it as moral decay, moral degeneracy, yep. and, and that was part of the the weakening and decline of the great. German nation. Right. Um, I think it gets underestimated here uh, how much of the Trumpian base fervently believes in religious values, whether it's, you know, the majority of which is uh, Christian nationalism, Christian denominationism, a very, you know, extreme and right wing form of Christianity. And it also right wing Catholic in terms of whether it's Opus Dei or just a form of this very far right of the Catholic Church. That's why abortion still becomes this symbolic issue. 
Uh, but liberalism in general is seen as a force of, of, of decay and weakening. Like, so you want to make America great again, you have to destroy liberalism in the culture and, 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 and it's okay to have authoritarianism if that's what it takes right. to accomplish that. And, and I, I interviewed this guy recently, Mickey, we Mickey Weinstein, and he works with this thing called the uh, religious uh, military, religious freedom foundation. And they fight against uh, evangelical and far right Catholic um, proselytizing and recruitment within the military. And he's estimating as much as a third of the military could already be organized Christian nationalists, and that at, it goes up to the uh, uh, very highest levels, and that the real secret of why the Joint Chiefs Millie, chairman of the Joint Chiefs, was so concerned and why they really thought a coup of, of some real threat was in progress, and, and they don't want to say this openly, and I'm not sure why, but it's because the extent to which of this Christian nationalism has such strength within the military, and they might have been able to invoke, uh, involve them in the January 6 events. Now, it failed, uh, but there's a real force there. Oh, no. Look, Paul, I mean, I agree completely. And, and, uh, and I've said this about, uh, um, uh, 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 about the January 6 thing for, for a while, <clears throat> that I mean, it's like a yeah, uh, yeah. On one level, it's like a Buster Keaton version of the Beer Hall Putsch in 1923, right? But um, but Trump was tossing the dice and was hoping that somebody would convoke this this you know, up to uh, you know, up to a third of the military. But, yeah, I mean, like we know they've got the Air Force, right? And the Air Force high high command has been saturated with a Christian nationalist fascist for some time coming from the Air Force Academy. So, yeah, I mean, that's real. Uh, but 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 I think and I think it's also important to stress that it's not like a genetic condition. Right. And uh, and I'm reminded that my good late late friend, you know, Anthony Mazaki, pointed out 30 years ago. That neoliberalism can't can't hold more and more people are going to find themselves driven to the wall. And if we, as as left progressives, you know, working class activists, or what well, whatever we are, can't find ways to get to people with convincing accounts of what's responsible for their fears and 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 anxieties, and suggestions about ways to move forward to overcome them, then much more dangerous and a reactionary forces will will do it, and they have you know, the virtue of having internally consistent seeming narratives, right? Which is what the scapegoating stuff stuff does. And what we're living with now is the fact that the right has been able to penetrate, you know, those, those populations much more effectively than the left has because the liberal, because the liberals never have anything to offer them except bubble gum and hard times and are always fresh out of bubble gum. So what they do is hector people, right? Uh, what well, about what well, about the need to to give up something, right? For blacks or for Native Americans or 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 or, or I mean for immigrants, and what, when you go out into like you know depressed areas of Ohio and Michigan and Wisconsin or whatever, and then try to tell people that they you know well but they have some kind of you know white privilege that they have to give up, right? I mean that's like holding a recruiting meeting for the Klan and the white nationalists, and and, and it's time for us. As a left to face up to that, I mean, you know, like I've been, you know, well, well, I've been ranting on this theme for as long as we've known each other, and and, and a lot longer. Uh, but this, so what we're reaping now, right, is the product of like a generation uh, or more uh, of of what the liberals have sown for us, and they've been offering us, you know, sort of partial, well, whatever, in effect, uh, you know, means tested approaches, like. Um, um, to social policy that define like uh, you know some people in as beneficiaries and define everybody out or else out and that also feeds you know, feeds a kind of resentment um, yeah I, I think this is so important what you're saying because if you looked at so much of the messaging from the left it's really directed at the liberal elites 
you guys should feel guilty, do something for blacks, do something for Latinos, you know, worry about what's going on at the border. Uh, and, and yes, okay, fine. There's a role for that kind of advocacy to try to pressure the elites. But that's not the message to the white working class because it's like anyone else, their first reaction is going to be, what's in it for me? I mean, you know, if you're struggling to survive every day, you don't have a lot of bandwidth to be worrying about everybody else. No. And, and I mean, look, like it's not even a very effective message with the black working class or the Hispanic working class, right? Because uh, so, yeah, I know. And um, I was talking to my son about this this morning, even that it's it's I think it may be time for us to take the next step in this chain of argument. Which is to consider the possibility that th these identitarian um, political tendencies and and the discourses and formations are 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 at this point ultimately active agencies of you know, of the ruling class, right? Uh, but I mean, it's striking. Jeff Jeff Bezos gives Van Jones a hundred million dollars. <clears throat> and yes, to give away, but, but still, it's a hundred million dollars. And we we know that that one thing that Jeff Bezos isn't it, it, it is a friendly to working class politics, right? I mean, not even for his own workers. Well, when you look at the um, you know the recently announced um, um, winners of the MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant, right? At, you know, at least three of them. Um, uh, um, Kendi, right? Uh, um, um, Ibram Kendi, Kianga Yamana Taylor, and, and and a third one that I'm blocking on now, are like um, um, avatars or exponents of you know, of this kind of of this kind of race reductionist politics, right? As a, a, as a progressive, so what does that do for us, right? Um, it, it does. Nothing for us w with respect to trying to, uh, you know, to struggle to make life life better for, for working people and, and uh, less precarious for for the working people of whatever color or, or gender. Um, but but it does something to you know, you know to further you know, to reinforce um, the fundamentally bourgeois what um, you know, understanding of social justice as being all about radical equality of opportunity, right? Uh, because that's what uh, the anti-disparity politics is all about, right? That, that, that the effective metric of social justice is, as one of the black power preachers said, I mean, back in the 60s, that blacks should, at every level of the population, from, from, from corporate CEOs and board members to, to custodians, be, um, be 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 uh, represented in proportions that are you know, roughly equivalent uh, roughly equivalent to their share of the overall population at at every point. Uh, but as as you know, um, um, uh, and Walter Ben Michaels and I have been arguing for a long long time now. That's a standard of justice that that means that the society could be just if one percent of the population controlled ninety percent of the resources. But so as long as, you know, 12 percent of that 1 percent were black, 14 percent were Hispanic, half women and uh, whatever. Right. That's in a political philosophy class or or, or say an ethics class. You know, that's a notion of a just society that's defensible and as defensible as any other. But to the extent that we're political actors is that the model of justice that we want to die die to realize? I say no, right? Uh, and I think it's time for us, you know, then well, whatever considers itself to be the left or 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 a progressive movement or whatever, that is to draw that that line in the dirt, right? And 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 and, uh, and to get people to be clear clear about what they're, you know, you know, about what they stand stand for and what they want. I mean. Um, I just saw, but I forget. Well, but I forget what it was. Now there's so many of them that come around. But I just saw a few days ago, like another celebration of of of, of some black first, right? It's another, you know, first black female CEO of whatever. And 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 my only response to that can be, 
who cares, right? I mean, who cares except people who are likely to benefit directly from breaking down these these you know barriers, right? And, and it's time that we just need to have um, um, a political discourse that focuses directly on concerns of of new working people. And if you don't mind, I'd like to make a plug now. The Debs Jones Douglas Institute um, is uh, preparing to start a podcast uh, you know, sometime in the next month, you know, month, a month and a half, that uh, we're calling Class Matters. And the tagline that accompanies is, it, it is, um, what would the country look like if it were governed by and for the working class, who are the majority, the vast majority of people who live, live in this society and would connect it, you know, uh, trade union leaders, and like this is going to be like what what our pod- podcast is all about, um, because because it, it's time for us to have that discussion, and not just to have it like in the coffee shops in Brooklyn, right? It, it, it's a time for us to try to encourage this this discussion off the internet, even and where and 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 in friendship, family, workplace personal networks, because because we've got to get out and do the same kind of organizing that the right, you know, was able to do after the, you know. And you can't do that without a real vision of what the society could be. Uh, Short, short term, midterm and long term, the whole conversation has to take place. Absolutely, man. You're absolutely correct. And, and I mean, that's kind of what we've been doing since we, um, since, since we, um, since we began with with a labor party advocates at the beginning of the 1990s right and 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 and, and, and uh, that's when the animating question you know i i go back i you know so much of the conversation about what the society could look like has simply focused on medicare for all and 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 barely goes beyond that you know, I, I'm dual citizen. I, I live in the U.S., Canada. I go back and forth. Well, in Canada, we have Medicare for all, more or less. And, and you know, one in five kids in Toronto live in poverty. Uh, so it's not the panacea. The, the conversation's got to go beyond beyond that. Well, no, I think that's right. And uh, and, and that's why I think now it, it is a good time for us to take stock of exactly that, you know, that question. Because Biden's um, Biden's presidency, First of all, it means that in practical terms, you know, the struggle for for uh, uh, you know, for, for uh, the Medicare for all is like off the table, right? Because nothing's going to happen in the Biden administration, right? But but that does leave us much broader space, like around the infrastructure stuff, or 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 many other issues, you know, to try to push debate about um, uh, the need for a public good approach to public policy. And, right, and course- but some people are going to say your focus on getting past 2022 uh, to create the space for organizing is, quote, going to once again tie the left down to electing whatever Democrat there is and, and, thing, and, you know, and things don't change. Uh, what do you say to them? Uh, well, uh, yeah, I do have a response, as you might imagine. Uh, 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 I have a couple. Uh, well, well, one of them is well, we aren't going to win anything w- worth having by 2022 or by tw- or, or 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 by 2024, right? I mean, no matter what. And it's important to note, as Sam as Sam Gendon, who I've had observed in a conversation a few weeks ago, that we also need to face up to the fact that the left, or our version of it anyway, is in no position to drive the current debates, right? So what can we do? But the most that we can do, for instance, is like around the infrastructure stuff. Uh, if uh, Brian Deese and and the other uh, Wall Street Keynesians have come to a sense that this, that 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 public policy, especially economic policy, has to do something beyond uh, what I'm stimulating you know, economic growth to take the pressure off off of the working people, right? Um, and, and that's fine. So we can try to be part of that conversation, or 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 on the edge of the conversation. But with respect to the infrastructure spending in particular, where even the Wall Street Keynesians seem to be le- leaning, is that the point is, as as Adiz put it once, that the point is that public spending should help to bring private capital to to investment opportunities, right? And what our view should be is that no. 
public spending on infrastructure needs to expand and to reinvigorate the public sector, right? Uh, keeping the post office going through through campaigns, which is now linked to Jeff Jones Douglas through, through, through the campaign for postal banking, right? That, that expands well, the social uses of the post office and also goes after these payday loan places that, and, and these check cashing joints that you know, gouge people like in, in that working class communities. So I don't think that we can, that we have the collective power, you know, although I never felt better about the progressive caucus in, in the house than, than I have in the past, past couple of weeks. Um, but we may not have the collective power to force them to do what we want, what we want them to do. But we do have the collective power to use debate in public, right, um, around these different ways forward to help us organize, right, and, and to organize among our own base. But the point is, right, that um, whether if 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 the Democrats don't hold Congress in 2022, and look, I, look, look, I've been fighting against the liberal Democrats practically all my life, right. But um, <clears throat> but if they don't hold power in 2022, something much much worse is going to happen, and we're going to be in much worse shape as as a left. But even more more important than what what it's going to mean for the 25 of us is it, 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 it's like working people are going to be screwed, right? And, and 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 screwed in a way that that it may well take generations to get out of. Well, let me let me just add. Yeah. I don't think that's the worst of what's going to happen because, you know, the working class is going to get screwed, whether the corporate Dems win or don't win, and they will get screwed worse. Right. But I don't, I don't think that's the big danger. The big danger is climate crisis. There is, there is yeah. practically no time left to deal with, with uh, decarbonization, a real, a, a legitimate climate strategy. And I think Right. The Biden strategy is very half baked. It relies on carbon capture, which is completely unproven. But at least there's a conversation there. Um, if if in 2022, never mind 2024, um, that climate deniers are in the majority in Congress, um, other than the odd state legislature, maybe a California, New York, a few other places. But in terms of a national policy, uh, we are all, I, I need to use a word stronger than screwed. We are all fucked right. because we are, we are, maybe we're already out of, well, we're certainly out of time in terms of not reaching 1.5 degrees warming. We are going to hit 1.5 and in all likelihood, we're going to hit two. That is, that is of such crisis proportions uh, because once you hit two, it's almost a, an unstoppable process. And that means you're on the way to three and four, which means most of the globe, certainly more than half of the earth becomes uninhabitable. Um, and, and to imagine what the politics of authoritarianism under those conditions are, because forget any even semblance of formal democracy when that happens. Well, yeah, well no, I think that's absolutely right, Paul. And, and also, I mean, the... Like I sometimes marvel, right, at the hubris of of, um, of really rich people, right? Uh, and I mean, uh, and actually, the first time I had this thought was when uh, you know Bush and Condi Rice and Cheney and Rumsfeld and and the rest of them uh, literally, I mean, demonstrated like in the summer of two thousand one that they couldn't, that none of them could identify countries on a map of the Middle East unless they were marked, right? And then like six months later, then they've got the hubris to think that they can redesign the political map, I guess, of the region. And the idea that kind of crystallized in my head was, wow, what was a combination of supreme arrogance that seems like it's only possible twins with supreme ignorance and vice versa. Uh, and, and I've noticed that, so I mean, rich people like to think that they, they can always find a way to protect themselves and to, and, and to buy themselves out of it, right? Like, like these clowns going into space or, um, or, or, or I was quite taken in a, in, um, in a Barbara Ehrenreich book. Um, I, guess, um, I think it's called 
on you know, unnatural causes. But but what about people like uh, 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 Elon Musk and a bunch of these other billionaires who who have devoted themselves to beating death, right? They want to live to run in marathons until they're 140. And what one of the Russians thinks that 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 he can beat death completely. And and I thought, okay, so like these are like filthy rich people who command resources and power, but but, but they have the mental and emotional I mean development of a 14 year old, right? Uh, so so I mean that kind of arrogance, and I guess it percolates down, right? Like you get to, I mean, by the time you get to, you know, finally it's basement level grifters like Marjorie Taylor Greene and, and Boebert and, and Cawthorn and Kirsten Sinema, who just don't think beyond the day and just, just can think of the Facebook likes that they'll turn into wheelbarrows full of money, uh, who are the decision makers, right? Uh, yeah, it's a big problem. But yeah, but obviously, like you're right about the existential crisis. I also think that there there's a significant section of people that voted for Trump who, because of their direct experience with extreme climate, are coming around to believing there really is a climate crisis. And it's a, a very important wedge issue that I don't think the left is using enough because the left, to go back to what we were talking about earlier, is so focused on, you know, I, I don't like using the term identity politics because it's too broad because, you know, there's a reason people fight for their identity and it's not all bad. It just has to be done as part of a broad movement for bigger objectives. And, and that's that's the problem. Is like everybody that's on doing anything has to also be doing climate. If you're not, you're missing the boat. Right. Yeah. Well, and look, I mean, but I think it all comes I think it all comes back to working class politics too, right? Because fracking, right? Um, but, but the other side, so, yeah, so, so if you drive across Pennsylvania, right? Um, once you get about 15 miles west of Harrisburg, you see the billboards, right? That, that the environmentalists, you know, the hippies, the liberals, they're trying to take your job away. And, you know, we've got to be able to get, but, but the steel workers, for instance, work up. But I mean, they represent a lot of those people. And we need to be able to engage, right, with steel workers, locals, right? I mean, the leadership, well, and the members just start having a conversation about this. Right? Well, this is, this is what infuriates me, other than foreign policy and issues of China, which you can talk about another time. This is what infuriates me most about the Biden administration, which is there's a proposal out there. And the uh, progressive economist Bob Poland has actually costed this out. You could subsidize every fossil fuel worker in the United States for three years for $2 billion. You could give them their current pay or make a differential subsidy between whatever they wound up doing otherwise. So take that out, six years. I mean, one Ford-class aircraft carrier, which is now up around 14 to $16 billion. I mean... It's so obvious that that's what the Biden administration should do. It also helped them electorally in states that are dependent on fossil fuels, which are most of the Republican support. And, and, they, and they don't do it because to do it would be to actually be serious about phasing out fossil fuel. And Biden wants to have his cake and eat it. He wants to be able to deal with the climate crisis without having a war with the fossil fuel companies. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right about that, too. And 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 uh, and, uh, and uh, Bob Poland has also done really great uh, work on the cost of just transition uh, in, in uh, health care, too, like the Medicare for all. And that's one of our signal issues with the new DJDI, too, because we've well, cause, you know, like the idea of a just transition came out of the old oil, chemical and atomic workers union, where they felt that the bulk of the workers or the bulk of the work that, that their members did was going to be phased out at some point because it's hazardous, right? It's right there in the name of the union, oil, chemical, atomic. Um, and so, so, so the leaders of the union thought they had to have a plan for this, right? And we brought that into the labor party and we've got it going now, but that's the way you've got to approach this stuff. But, but, but see, that means like with everything else, the first question ha has to be about any policy intervention or, or a proposed one. And the first question you has to do: What is this going to mean for the working class? And 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 I want to say for the record too, 
that when I talk about the working class, I mean something much broader than what I think people typically mean. And what I and we, you know, by, by extension, mean, mean about the working class is every one of us who is expected to work for a living or does uh, work for a living, who is who doesn't have you know, substantial management of what, what obligations, but who but who is also uh, what I'm likely to be no more than six months or a year from destitution, like without a job. Right. And I think that's something else that we need to do is, is to think more expansively and less in culturalist terms about what, you know, what the working class is and, and, and who makes it up. And I want to add this like additional shot that I like to make every time I can um, 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 against like the strains of anti-racist politics that come from, come ultimately from the Ivy League and from MSNBC, but that have presumed a juxtaposition between something called black people or people of color and in something called the worst, uh, you know, the working class, which in this narrative gets constructed as a racial group, right? Like the working class means white people when blacks and Hispanics and Asians are disproportionately uh, among the working class, right? Um, or, or, or greater rep representation among the working class. So I just want to say that for a record for anybody who, uh, uh, you, you want to think about it for for, for, for a couple of seconds. Yeah, I think that's uh, the thinking of people that have never actually been in the working class, <laughs> which is a completely uh, people don't yeah. get. If you haven't worked in a big factory or yeah. something like it, uh, you yeah. don't actually understand it's a different culture completely. Yeah. But yeah, that's yeah, a, yeah. that's another conversation. Right. So listen, th this is this is just the beginning of a conversation. Let me know about your podcast. Maybe we can do a joint one on this uh, envisioning. Oh yeah. That'd uh, be great. Because yeah. I'm I'm all into this. I, I I have a whole theory about how that if there was a progressive government, one of the first things I would do is uh, buy controlling interest in BlackRock, and I would <laughs> and and I would either buy or or create a competitor to Amazon because I think uh, you need oh, yeah. those would give you a levers of power in the economy. Oh, no, uh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you're thinking expansively about this because uh, I had a conversation once with a. Uh, you know, with an older friend of mine who who was uh, you know who was an official of the UE, and and uh, and 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 we were complaining about how hard we'd been working on a project, and I said to him, yeah, uh, yeah, well, Frank, you know, well, but the only thing that keeps me going is uh, imagining the trials after we we win, and um, Frank got a twinkle in his eye and he said, ah, yes, the trials, the only thing that'll be more fun is the roundup. <laughs> okay, I, I I would argue against all of that. So maybe we should do that on the on the next one. Right, okay. I, I, I don't think scaring the elite shitless is a very effective strategy. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thanks very much for joining me, Adolf. Uh, Paul, I mean, thanks for having me again. It's always a blast, brother. And thank you for joining us on the analysis.news. Again, please don't forget the donate button. That'd be great if you become a monthly subscriber. Uh, on YouTube, subscribe to the channel, get on our email list. Uh, and if you are watching on YouTube, it's really worthwhile going to the website, uh, theanalysis.news. There's content there that doesn't show up on, on YouTube. Uh, thanks again.